In 2005, these three people believed for five days they were astronauts, 200 kilometers above the Earth's surface on a Russian space shuttle. We've just seen the Earth, like, I can't even believe I'm saying that sentence. They were actually in a state-of-the-art Hollywood simulator in an aircraft hangar in England. <laughs> Solid rocket yeah, boosters have ignited. Come on, we <laughs> we're doing 28,000 kilometers per hour right now. It's like we haven't even left the ground. Filmed at a cost of 4.5 million pounds, it was the most elaborate television hoax of all time. An illusion. David Copperfield would be proud of. A hoax that required completely transforming an ex-US Air Force base into a fictitious Russian space camp. Nastrovoya. Nastrovoya. State-of-the-art engineering, simulator and sound design straight from the world of Hollywood. On the launch, we have a hydraulic ram which lifts up. An army of actors trained to improvise for every eventuality. You could tell this group anything about space and they would believe you. And they did. Gravity is like just about anything else. You can actually control it. This is the story of the most elaborate and expensive practical joke you've probably never heard of. Is it pipes or is it people laughing? Are we actually in space? This is the story of the Space Cadets. You are about to become the first British space <laughs> tourist. The year was 2005 and high concept reality TV was big business around the world. Shows like Big Brother and Survivor proved that television could provide drama and action without actors and networks were on the hunt for bigger and more ambitious conceits for ordinary members of the public to participate in. Earlier that year, this vague casting call was placed in national newspapers. Contestants thought they were applying for a mystery thrill-seeking reality show. What they were actually applying for was a show called Space Cadets, a show that when announced to the press was described as candid camera live in space and the most elaborate and ambitious one-off TV hoax of all time. From hidden camera formats like Punked and Trigger Happy to entire fake reality series like Joe Schmo and Invasion Iowa, television has always been a playground for practical jokes. However, this was to be different. This was to be the biggest and most expensive television hoax of all time, a £4.5 million production to convince ordinary members of the public they'd been selected to travel to a Russian space base, whereby just four of them would be chosen to become Britain's first space tourists on a five-day mission. It was an ambition so high, the show claimed if it worked. Neil Armstrong has said that if this show works, he'll eat his own helmet on the final show. To pull this off, they needed to find the right candidates. Having interviewed hundreds of applicants, they quickly eliminated anyone whose hobby was military bases or space. 50 were then brought to London and subjected to a series of tasks to test everything from their suggestibility, a hot dog and some fries, their willingness to take a joke, anyone too shy to disco was out. And crucially, their reaction to claustrophobia by being strapped into a sleeping bag for 20 minutes and then being trapped in a lift. Who could handle being trapped inside a shuttle and who we should discount. With the consent of their families, nine were then selected to take part in the mystery show, and they'd be joined by three undercover actors who'd help nudge the illusion along from the inside. All twelve of them met at an airport, where the true, but false, nature of the production was revealed for the first time. This plane here will take you to Russia. The best of the best will be sent into orbit. You may now board your plane and off you pop. I mean, it sounded believable, right? And why wouldn't it? Since 2001, where American businessman Dennis Tito paid $20 million to become the world's first space tourist, blasting off on a Soyuz spacecraft to spend seven days on board the International Space Station. I love space. Virginia-based company Space Adventures has been offering wealthy individuals with deep enough pockets the space tourism experience, and to date has launched seven different people on eight separate missions to the ISS. And in 2004, after American aerospace engineer Burt Rattan's Spaceship One became the world's first privately funded aircraft to achieve suborbital spaceflight. Would you like an M&M that's been to space? Richard Branson announced the formation of Virgin Galactic, which hoped to offer a more affordable way of experiencing space travel using Burt's follow-up space plane, Spaceship Two. The show even joked, And we reckon he's about two years behind us. So with space tourism being so fresh in people's minds in 2005, was it completely implausible that for these contestants, at this particular moment, that a reality TV show would be casting for the first British space tourists. They boarded a chartered plane where they were told the destination was the fictional space tourism agency Star, based almost 3,000 kilometres away in Russia. Oh, my kids going to go out and say, Oh, they're national, love my dad! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're not space, man. I know. My mum never had this in my life. In reality, they never left the country. 
they were flown on a carefully orchestrated flight path that would see them circle the North Sea for three and a half hours before landing less than 38 miles away at Lid Airport in Kent. They believed they had landed at Volgograd. Welcome to Russia. Having turned out all the floodlights on the runway, there was nothing to suggest otherwise. A short helicopter transfer later, and they arrived at their final destination, STARS training facility, not in Krimsk, but an ex-US Air Force base near Ipswich, just off the A-12. Also known as Bentwaters Parks, this decommissioned thousand-acre site that was once used by the US military throughout the Cold War would for four weeks have to masquerade as a Russian space base. If it looks familiar, it's likely because you've seen it before, from films such as Fast and Furious 6, The Numbers Station and Wonder Woman, to television shows like Top Gear. Bentwaters Parks, with its control towers, ammunition stores and hangar buildings, is a superbly authentic film and television location on the Suffolk coast. However, for its latest starring role, it needed a complete transformation if it was to be passed off as a Russian military establishment. The production team spared no expense in the makeover, actually travelling to Russia to purchase food from a supermarket in Moscow. They had to buy everything Everything from fizzy drinks to toiletries. Alongside costumes and other space-related paraphernalia from a local market. Time to bargain on Russian style. Meanwhile, an aircraft dismantler back in Essex would provide military bric-a-brac like control panels, jet engines and surface-to-air missiles that were once used on Die Another Day. This aircraft junk will go a long way to making our base look like the real deal. The production team had to be meticulous in their set design, replacing all plug sockets with their Russian counterparts, changing all the signage and carefully erasing every last bit of English from existence. One detail out of place and the game is up. And when they were finished, they'd built their own piece of Russia right here in England. It cost millions to build, but are the space cadets going to buy it? From the moment the cadets' helicopter landed... Welcome to Russian military space base, Krimsk. A highly choreographed series of events played out... You are not on the list. ...to bring the illusion to life. Oh my God, look at the sign, look at the sign. ...from encountering Russian tanks... Tank! A real life tank, yeah. ...to patrolling armed guards, complete with barking dogs... That's not an Alsatian. ...to passing through authentic-looking checkpoints... Have a look at that! Electrical f***ing fences! The illusion appeared to be holding as they pulled up to the barracks. That is a real stupid And were introduced for the first time to mission commander James Campbell, a convincing actor called Richard with a truly excellent moustache. I must congratulate you on being chosen to embark on this historic adventure. However, the real work starts now. Someone is going to go to space. Sarah Jane described the whole adventure to space as Chessington's world of adventure times 10,000. <laughs> Over the next three weeks in the grand tradition of reality shows, they all slept in a shared dormitory as they undertook what they believed to be STARS astronaut training program, where they were told just four of them would be selected to go into space at the end of it all. In the words of STARS mission motto, Eto ni rapid strength. Over the following days, they took part in twice daily PT sessions led by genuine ex-KGB hardman, Val. Artist man I have ever, ever, ever met. Attended space lectures and training that was 80% genuine. The flight director is usually simply referred to as flight. Capcom. It used to be called the Capsule Communicator, hence Capcom. And 20% nonsense. Gravity is like just about anything else. Once you understand it, you can actually control it. Some by bona fide experts, such as Chris Welsh. This guy here is Mendeleev. He's a, he was a Russian scientist. He was the guy who came up with a periodic table. And some by actors with a Russian accent. This was Minsky's space nappy. New star systems were invented. Our galaxy is one of a group called the Hazelnut Cluster. The Hazelnut what? The Hazelnut Cluster. <laughs> New code names made up. Flight Dynamics Officer is Fido, Lido, Nakas, Mummy. And history rewritten. An entire city is named after this. As a mark of respect, we've suffered. As the days ticked by, the team pushed the boundaries a little bit further every time. Okay, we go. <laughs> My air pipe is blocked. Excellent. And apart from a few moments where they got close to the truth, I look at Russia, it's cold. It seems to me like England. The subterfuge appeared to be working. Can you imagine being in space floating around with a wicked spacesuit on, man? Them things cost bucks, I'm telling you. Even at times fooling the actors themselves. I actually asked him a question that was a bit tricky. At that point, I thought I was a trainee astronaut. So how was this possible? Why didn't they suspect something was amiss? Well, the answer might lie in a 70-year-old experiment. Group dynamics are one of the most powerful forces in human psychology. 
In 1951, psychologist Solomon Ash conducted a series of social conformity experiments exploring how individuals' opinions are influenced by the group around them. Participants thought they were taking part in a visual perception test to match the line on the left and determine which of the three lines on the right is equal to it in length. In reality, everyone else in the room was an actor under instructions on certain questions to unanimously choose the incorrect answer. Two. 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 75% of those taking part gave at least one incorrect response. Two. Not necessarily because they believed it was right, but because they were potentially thrown off or yielded to the pressure of the group. Inspired by these findings, television shows often conducted their own variations on Ash's classic experiment. From this candid camera stunt in 1962, where unwitting participants entered a lift, only to be surrounded by undercover actors who all insisted on facing the rear to this casting call for a Darren Brown experiment, where actors were told to stand up and sit down upon hearing a bell, to which genuine participants would quickly end up conforming to. Even though nobody told them to do this. In many ways, Space Cadets, with its immersive alternative reality, an army of actors in authority roles, Imagine it's you in there. Why wouldn't you believe it? was the ultimate conformity experiment. And it appeared to be working. After three whole weeks of needless exercise... You never told me it was going to be this tough. 65 hours of mm, somewhat true lectures... If they find out that there's an asteroid heading towards Earth, might we be called upon to try and deal with it? Like no. Arming. And a final exam... I'm just annoyed I ain't got 100%. All the cadets passed out. You are all now potential space tourists in a ceremony that would accumulate with them proudly saluting a Russian poem entitled Courage and Endeavour. That was actually a recipe for toad in the hole. And finally, that evening, the cadets that were about to boldly go nowhere were chosen. The first person allocated a place is Charlie. Yeah. The second person, Paul. Yeah. Yeah. And the last is Billy. <sighs> The first stage of the illusion was complete. The second would be much harder. After all, how do you convince someone that they're blasting off into space without ever leaving the ground? Well, you talk to the experts, Hollywood experts. This is Brick Price. His California-based Wonderworks are the leading special effects company when it comes to replica spacecraft. If you want to create the illusion of space, they are the people to build it. Their replica space shuttle cockpit had previously been used in blockbuster films such as Deep Impact and Space Cowboys. Using that as a starting point, they got to work converting it into a fully-fledged space simulator. A giant screen 7 metres tall and 20 metres wide would provide a vivid IMAX-style image of planet Earth out of the front-facing windows. It's space gym, but not as you know it. Huge pneumatic airbags would be programmed to keep the simulator moving 24 hours a day. About a half an hour, I find that I, I need to get my land legs back. And during liftoff, a giant hydraulic ram would lift the entire front section of the shuttle. It gives you that sense of acceleration because you're pushed into the seat. When you couple that with movement, it is terrifying. And then they needed noise, lots of it. So they recruited top Hollywood sound designer Dean Andre concealing 40 speakers throughout the walls and ceilings of the set. This is the equivalent of taking a nightclub sound system and putting it in your bathroom at home. To create the sound of a launch, he combined recordings from an actual shuttle launch, an F-14 fighter engine. A combination of 15 to 20 different aircraft in there, plus explosions. We're taking off, we're taking off. The rockets kick in. And boom. I'm actually feeling like you're taking off. Ah, oh, this is impressive. But there was still one gigantic black hole-sized admission from the whole experience. Weightlessness. They were told they'd be going into a low Earth orbit with an altitude of 200 kilometers. Now, the weightlessness astronauts experience in such an orbit isn't due to the absence of gravity. In fact, at 200 kilometers, they'd be subject to largely the same amount of gravity as on Earth, but by constantly free-falling due to the effect of gravity alone. But the cadets didn't know any of this, so they just made it up. We can tell them what we want. They were told it wouldn't be a vertical takeoff. This craft cannot take you into deep space. It takes off and lands from a runway. And that, crucially, is that it's unlikely you'll experience weightlessness. Because three AGGs, or artificial gravity generators, would kick in upon entering orbit. Gravity is like just about anything else. Once you understand it, you can actually control it. So it can be overcome and it can be recreated. So that's how they counteract weightlessness with the anti-gravity generators, three of them. And they bought it. You could have said the anti-gravity generators were run by miniaturized hamsters. Bring it on. Whatever you've got, we'll believe.
Tonight on Space Cadets, we attempt to launch Paul, Billy, Kerry and actor Charlie into space. After five shows covering the cadets' training, it was finally time for the event that everyone had been waiting for. It's a nice night for a shuttle launch, I think you'll agree. Launch night. Behind the scenes, a year's worth of preparation had taken things to this point. The cadets had been living a lie for more than three weeks, and no one really knew if it would work or not, so the illusion for the chosen three had to step up a gear. Having given a fake press conference to apparent journalists, like any history-making space tourist might expect... What do you plan to say? One small step for reality TV. One giant leap for a Bristol boy. That was going to be mine. They were then given a backstage tour of the shuttle hangar they'd be blasting off from the next day. Oh my god! More smoke and mirrors, in this case literally to disguise the fact there wasn't actually a real spacecraft for them to see, making do with a hastily assembled nose cone and some movie magic special effects. Oh, this is, this is movie stuff. It looks beautiful, doesn't it? Before a final short visit in a slightly Truman Show-esque sequence to Mission Control. This is Mission Control. A genuine operations room from the Cold War that had been dressed with props, actors... Fido, Dido, Lido, Nakas is over there and this chap is your money and even sound designer Dean Andre in a lab coat. Oh, hey, pleasure yeah. to meet you. To play the role of Capcom. We've been practicing this for forever. We're really excited. Do you mind as well? Right, I think we're Oski. Oh, can't wait. Video diaries captured the tangible excitement in the hours before they thought they were going into space. Oh, my God. Things are just getting more and more real now. Whilst viewers at home felt a slight pang of guilt that it was all a lie. This time tomorrow, I might be in space. <laughs> but we were too wrapped up in whether it was even possible. All that was left was for the cadets to suit up, You're nice people. say goodbye to their friends, See you later. Thank you. <laughs> and make the transfer to what they believed was Earth Orbiter 1. General Purpose Computer Power is on. First four British astronauts in space. For such an expensive hoax, the game could have been blown on the smallest possible detail, and it almost was. Upon entering the simulator, Carrie almost kicked the curtain down, revealing the whole thing. If that curtain had just moved, and the whole thing would have been blown. Here we go! Yay! Yay. Well done, guys. Well done. Three, two, one, oh my God, oh my zero. God. But the problems didn't end there. Capcom Crimson, we have power loss. The hydraulics are moving the shuttle, but inside, they can't hear a thing. Could have meant game over. It sounded like someone was trying to start a lawnmower underneath this. A negative one, Capcom Crimson. Negative Mark. Capcom I thought for a while that it just had, had failed, the whole system. If it wasn't for the quick thinking and improvisation of the two actor pilots... Do some final uh, last-minute checks to ensure everything. They are towing us out. My car's like this in the morning. <laughs> After a very tense two minutes, the sound problems are ironed out and we have liftoff. Right. Five, Not four, dead. We've got three, from the two, one, We are going for takeoff, all right? The launch astonishingly went as planned. We're doing 28,000 kilometers per hour right now. This is amazing. This is amazing. We are going so fast. And while their bodies weren't experiencing the g-force you'd expect if you're actually launching into space. No g-force, so you didn't sort of like kind of just sit back like that. The actors. We're going to be jettisoning the side rock. Any second now. The sound. But the noise. You know, if you watch a film or something, it's exactly like that. The environment. The maximum dynamic pressure has been reached. All fed into the illusion. Just easing into orbit, we'll go around the world in uh, 90 minutes. Even actor Charlie was convinced. Bewildered by how successful the illusion is being. And while the first doubt started to creep in. It feels like we're still on the ground. When Drew says, right, we're in space now, I was like, what? They were quickly pushed to the back of their minds with this incredible moment where the view out of the cockpit was revealed and the cadets looked down at what they thought was the curvature of the Earth for the first time. It's absolutely amazing. We've just seen, we've just seen the Earth, like, I can't even believe I'm saying that sentence. We're just so happy. A bit, I just saw the world. <laughs> it was a truly brilliant television moment. This was by far the emotional peak and high point of the series. All the problems in the world just seem minor, you know that? Like, yeah, just, yeah, that's just, what they, they just, see. It's, yeah. They just don't know. Like, all the wars and stuff that's going on just know. seems like... All the social engineering, the simulator, all brought the show to this point. Uh, yeah, uh, we're in space. Space is great. Space is the place. We've just seen the Earth. That was humbling. I'm just so deep within it myself. I, uh, I, I, I know where I am, and yet I don't. And I'm just thrilled, and I'm happy, and I'm so proud that I'm and lucky that I'm here. 
The challenge was, having made three members of the public genuinely believe they're in space, where do you go from there? Well, it felt as a viewer that the show wasn't entirely sure of that question either. The cadets' orbit around the Earth will not always be smooth space sailing. The title sequence teased aliens, and an earlier episode featured sound designer Dean Andre throwing cat food in his van to recreate a meteor shower. And it sounded like little bits and pieces of meteor. As part of an event that never materialized on screen. My neighbors think that I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> How do you like that? The reality was a series of increasingly bizarre experiments. Their opportunity to further mankind's understanding of the universe in which we live. From making balloon animals while wearing gloves, to seeing if fruit could power a fax machine in space. The lights are on. We faxed you something. <laughs> Negative. We do not have a wire long enough. As the hours and days ticked by, actors Charlie, Alex and Drew were challenged with staging increasingly ludicrous scenarios. They're not going to believe I've done this. Stretching the fictional mission's credibility to breaking point and beyond. You're watching Russia's only gymnastics channel. From this astronaut initiation ceremony. I stand before Uranus. Begging for admittance. To actor Charlie's so-called intestinal worm. No, I can't look at it. What the f*** is it? I'm really scared now. Sorry, I'm such a terrible actor. Or most absurd of all, a funeral for dead dog, Mr. Bimby. We are gathered here today in love and memory of TV dog star, Mr. Bimby. Show some respect, folks. That accumulated in, yep, you guessed it. Oh! The ashes being dropped on the floor and sucked up in a dustbuster. Don't worry about it. Suspicions had well and truly been raised. Good joke. Yeah. If it's not, I'm really sorry. Is it pipes or is it people laughing? <laughs> <laughs> Bimby's coming up on us because we laugh at this camera. And for the cadets, the only thing that would now eliminate those doubts... I kind of feel like it's not real. Are we actually in space? ...would be a spacewalk. Spacewalk, then I'll be thinking we are in a simulator. <laughs> no, they wouldn't get to that trouble on there. The previous evening, the hoax was revealed to the other candidates. We're not in Russia. We're still in England! Star is a fictitious company. <laughs> And they took the whole experience in their stride. They're 300 yards away in a state-of-the-art simulator. Did they know that? No. <laughs> we have been had! But how would the cadets on board fare when it was revealed their historical accomplishment was just a big and expensive joke? All I want to do is do the spacewalk and then I can see the Earth from where I wanted to see it. To prepare for the spacewalk, they entered a capsule that they thought would be moving them away from the shuttle on a robot arm. It's the culmination of both their mission and, in a sense, ours. However, they were instead about to be suddenly brought back to Earth. Now, there have been lots of rumours and discussion about how the grand reveal would actually take place, with many speculating some sort of Hollywood-style emergency. The reality, presumably guided by experts, was far tamer. Hello there, Billy, Kerry, Paul. A tape played back to them in the capsule their own suspicions. And everything feels a bit caravan. To give them one last chance to work it out for themselves. We could just be in a simulator at the moment. Oh, oh no. I knew it! It's time to come home. What? Meanwhile, stagehands transported the pod oh, into the studio. No! 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 Before the doors were finally flung open. Oh, no! It's fair to say their initial reactions made for slightly uncomfortable viewing at the time. I'm a little bit like broken hearted. You're not actually in Russia at all. That's the big thing. You're in England. <laughs> Near Ipswich. Oh, no. <laughs> Ipswich. Ever visit here as a kid, anyone? No, uh, not if once again. Okay, okay. <laughs> However, the sweetener of a genuine trip to Russia to experience a zero gravity flight on the so called Vomit Comet. That's good. That's yeah. A £25,000 yeah. check. How about that? Yeah, I'll take that. And the warm embrace from the audience made the pill certainly easier to swallow. Can the actors please stand up? Oh, oh great. James. Oh, I had that dream James, James. 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 And after a somewhat brisk 20-minute interview to cap off the series... If you're ever lucky enough to meet them, salute them as the heroes they are. Mission accomplished, over and out. I give you the Space Cadets. That was it. Space Cadets was over. The following week, actor Charlie Skelton published this article in The Guardian as a coda to the oddest three and a half weeks of his life. In it, he describes how his default brain position aboard the shuttle was 200 kilometers up because too many things were telling me that to think otherwise. The simulator was too damned convincing. He goes on to recall how the day after the big reveal, he met fellow cosmonaut Billy in the hotel lobby, who asked him, It was real, wasn't it? What we were thinking and feeling. And I assure him, it was. After all, for Paul, Carrie and Billy, they all experienced something that only a small group of actual astronauts had ever truly felt. You've actually gone through things that we'll never experience here. You've known what it's like to believe you're looking at the Earth. I'll never have that. And anyone who ever normally goes into a simulator knowing they're going to a simulator never has that. So you've actually looked at the Earth and felt those things. While we'll never know if Neil Armstrong ate his own helmet or not, 
commercially, Space Cadets wasn't a success. Then director of programs Kevin Ligo the following year admitted that the hoax reality format was a mistake, primarily because it was so expensive to make. For me, one of the joys of television is one of the few mediums where budget, ambition, scale, spectacle can all come together, not necessarily to change the world, but to launch someone into fictional space on a simulator for no other reason but the entertainment challenge of doing so. And in a world today with ever more choice of what to watch, risks like this one, 4.5 million pound bets to create Russian space bases near Ipswich, will likely never be taken again. And that's kind of sad. Television for me is at its most exciting when it's bold, when it's unpredictable, when it's pushing the boundaries of the most ludicrous ideas possible. For me, much of the fun of Space Cadets was the fact it was even happening at all. The challenge like a Mission Impossible style plot to see if they could pull it off. And they did. So on that note, the cadets, as Johnny Vaughan once said, I salute you. Thanks for watching. See you next time.